You're listening to Rabbi Arya Wolby, Director of Torch, the Torah Outreach Resource Center of Houston. This is the Jewish Inspiration Podcast. This episode is sponsored by the Museum of Fine Arts, Houston. The Museum of Fine Arts, Houston is proud to present Beauty and Ritual, Judaica from the Jewish Museum, New York. An exquisite exhibition exploring the artistic, ritualistic, and cultural significance of Jewish ceremonial objects. Beauty and Ritual is just a taste of what's to come, as the MFAH will open the Albert and Ethel Hurstein Gallery for Judaica in early 2023. Gary Tintero, director of the MFAH, told the Jewish Herald Voice, I was raised in a Jewish household, so this initiative makes me happy and proud. It's a privilege to bring beautiful and rare works of art to Houston audiences. General admission tickets are available at mfah.org slash tickets. Beautiful Sunday morning to everyone. It's so wonderful to be back here. We're on the third part of a three-part series talking about Judaism's perspective on pleasure. And in fact, Judaism has a lot to talk about when it comes to pleasure. The first is that God wants us to enjoy in this world. He wants us to have pleasure in this world. It is critical to have pleasure as part and parcel of our service of the Almighty. Number two is that if someone doesn't find the proper pleasure we mentioned in the service of God, they're doing it wrong. If someone does a mitzvah, if someone observes Shabbos, if someone does any type of mitzvah and doesn't derive pleasure from it, there's something wrong in how they are experiencing or observing that mitzvah. Then we talked about how to connect with the Almighty. And then we mentioned the dangers of counterfeit pleasure. Counterfeit pleasure is dangerous because it can pull us away and take us away from where we need to be. And now we're going to talk the importance of being careful of counterfeit pleasures. So now we're going to talk about the point of challenge when it comes to pleasure. And the author here says, <laughs> Pleasure is the point of challenge of our choice, our free will, when it comes to emuna, believing in God. <laughs> After everything we've spoken about, Shahashemizbarahimid <laughs> Et inyan hatanu, that God placed this whole concept of pleasure, shuhu yen nikudat nisayon baolam. That is the point of challenge. You want to know where everybody, every human being struggles in their life? They struggle with pleasures. Every human being struggles with pleasures. Should I focus on the right pleasure? Or should I focus on the fraud pleasure? Well, I'll tell you, it's much easier to delve our lives into the fraud pleasure. Much easier. But that's where the challenge is always going to be. Where God created both of them. We said previously, God created one opposite the other. Now you can choose. Here you have the platter. You can pick and decide for yourself which path is the way to go. Shuhu yen nukudat nisayon ba'olam. This is the point of challenge in the entire world. Every single person faces the same challenge. And the man is tested. Mankind is tested by this single test. How much we believe in the oneness of Hashem. And you remember, let's just step back a second. What did we say? What existed before the world created? Nothing. Just the Almighty. Hashem existed before the creation of the world. That's it. Hashem, when he created a world, what was that world? That was his will. And everything that has come out of this world since that point, like this pen, is Hashem's will. Everything that has, that's existing in this world is the will of Hashem. Hashem wills it into creation. This power of everything that exists is connected with the Almighty. Yet, each and every one of us have a piece, so to speak, 
God is not a material entity that we can, oh, let's chop up little pieces and put a piece into everyone. Everyone has the spirit of Hashem. I'll give you an example. We say in, in Genesis, and God blew into the nostrils of man a living soul. What do we exist by? We exist by a body and a soul. The body is visible, the soul is not. Just like Hashem's body, so to speak, which is His creation, is visible, while He Himself is not visible. But what do we need to serve? Do we need to serve the body or do we need to serve the soul? The body which is visible or the soul which is invisible? God's world which is visible or God who is not visible? And we have these two forces that are conflicting, so to speak. One is pulling, I want food. I want sleep. I want the physical pleasures of this world. Versus... I want holiness. I want something spiritual. I want something lofty, something heavenly. And these are the struggles that we're all facing every day of our lives. You know, I I said this many times. When a baby is born, the baby cries. Why does the baby cry? What's the problem? You got your mama. She's going to take care of you. She's going to feed you. She's going to cherish you. She's going to hug you and kiss you. What's the problem? What are you crying? Because it was in a place that was all spiritual. It was in a place where it was able to see from one end of the world to the other, says the Midrash. What does that mean? It is able to see from one one end of the world to the other, meaning there was no physical barriers. It was clarity, total world of clarity. It gets tapped on the lip, forgets all its Torah, forgets all its knowledge, all its wisdom, and now... It's living in a different reality. It comes into this physical world where we have all of the, the, the materialistic trappings that bombard us. So we say, oh, little baby, don't cry. Here's a pacifier and here's balloons and here's a doll and here's a, a truck and here's a, you know, and here's all the toys and we'll give you Lego and we'll give you, you know, Play-Doh and we'll give you all of these toys. Just don't cry. But the soul is still yearning. It's saying, I want to be back in that great place where I was, and it was so perfect. I was connected with the Almighty with no barriers. I was in a a spiritual realm, and now you take me out of that, and you put me into this physical body, and I'm locked like I'm in a prison. Soul doesn't want to be here. The body wants to be here. The soul doesn't want to be here. So what do we need to do to give that soul its life, to give it its lifeline, a connection with the one and only Hashem. And when we give it that connection with the one and only Hashem, and we understand that everything that God created is here perfect, we can build on that relationship. If it is clear to a person that there is nothing that exists other than the Almighty and the will of the Almighty, Right? This pen only exists because of the will of the Almighty. If the Almighty didn't will this into existence, it wouldn't be here. So everything that exists, we have to understand this also as a tool to love every human, every human being. Why should we love every human being? Because they're a creation of God. And God thought that they needed to be in this world, which is why He put them here. They don't have to think like us. They don't have to look like us, and they don't have to vote like us, and they don't have to have uh, world perspectives like us, and values like us, but we have to recognize that there's godliness in every single creation, and it changes our perspective, it should at least, it should change our perspective so that we understand that everything is godly. Yes, and that's why there's actually a mitzvah not to waste an example of that, food. You have food, don't waste the food. Don't waste food. Bal tashchit, don't destroy God's creation. You know, I'll, I'll share a story. I, I say this many times when I talk about gratitude and appreciation. There was a great rabbi that lived in Muncie where I grew up, Rabbi Mordechai Schwab. 
And my mother was very, very, my, my parents were very, very close with this great rabbi, a really holy, special man. His smile could light up the world. Uh, it was, it was unbelievable. It was such a great man. When he passed away, my mother went to the Rebetzin, to his wife, who was sitting Shiva, who was during the week of mourning. And she told my mother an amazing story. She said, Rav Schwab has such gratitude for everything that he possessed. He recognized that it was a gift from God. So he had a pair of pants that was already all worn out. He wore it for, for several years, you know. So what he did was, is he cleaned it and it was ironed nicely. And he would, on his bed, he would say, thank you so much for taking care of me. Thank you so much for keeping me warm. Thank you so much for making me look good. And then he'd move it a little bit off towards the end of the bed. And the next day he would do the same thing and then move it a little bit off the bed. And then till it got off the bed almost, and then he would fold it up lovingly, put it in a bag and throw it out. Not to waste God's creation, to, to recognize that it's here, it's a gift. I have to maximize that gift and not just throw it out without any heart, without any soul, without any meaning, without, without any regard for what it did for me. To utilize everything that we have in this world as a tool to recognize God in this world. It's here because God gave it to me. The people you have around you, the relationships can change by the recognition that everyone was placed there for us. They were placed there for us by the Almighty. He handpicked them. He says, I want you to have this person in your life to be your soulmate. That's the half of your neshama that's coming together here. And therefore, it's important for us to recognize, number one, Hashem is the one and only one. Nothing exists other than Hashem's will. And that only the Almighty is the source of life and the source of all good. And therefore, if a person recognizes that, he'll say, one second, in that case, what am I doing to ensure that I am part of that goodness. You know what it is? Well, I have to dedicate my life to doing the will of Hashem. And therefore, he's going to be motivated to only search for godly sources of pleasure, real pleasure. If I want to connect, so, so we mentioned last week, so you're eating with your friend, you're eating with your friend lunch, right? You're both ordering the same sandwich, kosher sandwich. Okay. Now you're having lunch. So you can both eat two different foods while you order the same item on the menu. One is it's physical and I just want to satiate my hunger. The other says, you know what? Oh, I have to remember that this is godliness and therefore I'm going to recite a blessing. And now what I did was, before, because I recited a blessing on my food, thanking Hashem for the food that He's given me, now what happens? Now this food becomes spiritual. This food can become a very different connection point with the Almighty. Because I've infused this meal with godliness. Bringing God into this relationship here. So it's the same food, but it's very different food. One has become a vessel through which I connect with the Almighty. So now we continue. He says, O Shechalila Adam Yipal Me'amuna. And if God forbid a person falls from his emuna, from his knowledge of Hashem, and that everything that exists is from Hashem, he said, He might think that there is pleasure and goodness in things that are just the fake, the fraud, the counterfeit. It looks so glamorous. It looks so enjoyable. And then when you get into it, it's empty. It's vacant. And then, God forbid, one can fall into the pleasures of the Yetzahara, which are there to distract us. A perfect example of that is media. We mentioned this last week. Media is there to control our minds and to control our thoughts and to control our 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 wallets, to infuse us with new ideas. Oh, 
You have to buy this uh, vacation package. Oh, you have to do this. Oh, you have to eat that. You have to use this this product for your hair. And you have to... Uh, they're trying to constantly bombard you and not give you a moment to think, not a moment to just have quiet, to process things. We have to shut things out. We are the gatekeepers of our environment. And if we don't take control of what it is we're allowing ourselves to be impacted by, then the ride is a long ride. But if we realize that everything is from Hashem, and we realize that we are the gatekeepers of that environment, and therefore I am very selective about what I let into my mind, and very selective about what I let my eyes see, then I keep myself in an environment of holiness, an environment of kedusha of sanctity, and then it becomes my decision what I allow in and what I don't. And it's very important uh, for a person to have a, a clarity of what's real and what's not real because it's a very slippery slope and a person can find themselves only, I have people talk to me all the time about this, like, Rabbi, what can I do now? I'm in my 50s, I'm in my 60s, And my whole life, I've been running after money. I've been running after career. I've been running, but I forgot to invest in family. I forgot to invest in things that are important. I forgot to invest in myself. Most important thing in myself. Who am I to get to to build my relationship with God? And now what do I do? The answer is it's never too late. It's never ever too late for any person who wants to connect with the Almighty, because as long as we're here on this side of the grass, we're good We're good to go. One of my favorite bumper stickers I've, I've ever seen was a, someone had on there, it was grass, and on top of it, it said good. On the bottom, it said bad. As long as you're on top of the grass, you're good. You've got time. God wants that connection with you as well. God put us here to have pleasure. But, you know, I was giving a class yesterday on Shabbos afternoon and we got it to the same topic in a totally different book and we came through it in a different angle. What I wanted the guys to understand in this class was that the soul, our soul, is like a vacuum cleaner. You take a vacuum cleaner and you take out the nozzle and you leave go of it for a second, what's going to happen? It grabs onto your pants, your skirt, to the tablecloth. You know what I mean? It it grabs a drape. Well, what, what, what are you, what are you jumping? What are you running? What are you doing? You know, you know what the vacuum cleaner really is? The vacuum cleaner is thirsty. He wants pretzels. All right. Give me some crunchy pretzels and you hear it go through the nozzle. You hear that noise. It's like, ah, yum, delicious. I got it. The soul is the same thing, but it looks for holiness. And if you don't feed the soul holiness, it goes crazy and it takes whatever it can. So you're sitting there on a Sunday afternoon. You're like, well, what am I going to do now? Oh, I guess I must be hungry. So you go get yourself some food. Oh, didn't do it. I must be thirsty. You go get yourself a drink. Didn't do it. It must be that I need to go to the movies. And then it goes, it leads one thing to another. Oh, I should buy myself something new. And it goes from endless, endless seeking for what? Fulfillment of the soul. The only way to fulfill the soul is with the connection with the Almighty. It's like that vacuum cleaner. If you don't give it garbage, you know what's going to happen? It's going to go crazy and catch on to a drape or catch on to a a tablecloth because it needs something. Give me, give me, give me something to to eat. Give me something. Our soul has a never-ending desire for connection with God. It longs to be where it was in the mother's womb where it was in a world of clarity, where it had no distractions, where it had no interference. There were no radios and no televisions. It's it's an amazing thing that is as technologically advanced as our world has become, the baby in the womb and the birth of a child is still the same way it was 3,300 years ago when the Jewish people were at Mount Sinai and 5,783 years ago when the world was created with Adam and Eve. Exactly the same way. From that point on, we have been able to add 
gadgets and many toys with lights and noises and all of these gadgetries everything to distract us. But that baby, when it's in the mother's womb, knows what it means to have a connection with God. And the moment it comes out, it's facing that challenge. And each one of us are that little baby in a little bit larger form trying to find that connection with the Almighty. And we can try to appease ourselves with external physical pleasures. We can find, try to find it with food, with drink, with vacations, with whatever it is. Or we can connect inside. Who am I? And where's the godliness within me? And the moment we discover that godliness within me, we talk about this in our Musa traits. We talk about this, which is all internal things. You don't see someone's anger if it's inside. You don't see someone's patience when it's inside. You don't see someone's... These are all internal traits. That's where we work on ourselves. We work on ourselves on the inside. We inspire ourselves through the outside. We'll get to that at a different time. We'll talk about that. Now, Vihine, and behold, our belief and knowledge of Hashem is not an independent idea. It is the essence of all of our service of God. All of our work in this world is about our emuna, our knowledge of God. And it is the purpose of our entire life. You want to know what our entire life is about? It's how much we can make God one in our life. That we can have knowledge, we can have clarity with un- uninterrupted, with unadulterated clarity. Yes, I know with 100% knowledge, and Muna means faith or belief, but we translate it as knowledge because taking a leap of faith means I don't know, maybe yes, maybe no, could be, I believe so. These are all terms that don't have knowledge. When you have knowledge, when you look into your life and you're able to see with clarity, Hashem is right here with me. Hashem is involved in my every moment of life. That's a different type of relationship than having some leap of faith. No, no leap of faith. It's knowledge. Right? This is things that we say in our, in our, in Psalms. We have it in the Torah that we have knowledge of God, not faith. We have to have knowledge, but that is the purpose of our entire life is building that knowledge more and more solid every day so that there's no, well, maybe there is, maybe there isn't. No, no, no. We have to confirm it, investigate it. That is the the essence of the entire Torah and the mitzvahs. Is getting us to a point where we have clarity of God's oneness in this world. The moment we have that clarity, and it's at 100% capacity, that's perfection in life. That's the ultimate pleasure. How many people out there are concerned about their livelihood. Well, I don't know if I'll get fired tomorrow. I don't know if I... And people... I'll tell you someone who has no fear of what happens tomorrow. No fear whatsoever. No stress, no anxiety, nothing. Someone who believes in Hashem. Think of a baby again. A baby knows when their mother is there, they're taking care of everything for them. Nothing to worry about. Everything is taken care of. Because the mother is there to nourish them, is there to clean them, is there to bathe them, is there to to just everything they need. The mother is there to take care of them. Do you see a baby dealing with anxiety attacks? No. That's us for grown-ups to to have, right? But we're God's baby. If we recognize that Hashem is right there and He's there to feed us and He's there to clothe us and He's there to clean us, We have nothing to worry about. What am I worried about? Ah, I kicked God out of the picture and that's why I'm stressed out. The minute I keep God in that picture and I recognize and I rely on Hashem 100%, 
One of my favorite Torah ideas is about Moshe. We know that Moshe, it says that Moshe wanted to see God's glory. God says, you know what? You can see the back of my head, not the, not the front of my face. So to me, that's always, it's a, it's, it's ridiculous. I mean, come on, give me a break. Hashem doesn't have a front of his head like it doesn't have a back of his head. God is not a physical form. So what is Moshe asking to see? And what is God telling him by saying, you can see the back of my head? So the first thing is, is that when you see someone's face, you see their expression. You can see someone doing something in a distance. You see only their back. You see the action that they're doing, but you don't see the expression. The expression could be one of love. The expression could be so, so one of sadness. It could be happy. It could be angry. All you see is the action that the person is doing. You don't see their face. So that's one perspective of seeing the face versus the back. Is you only see the action. The Almighty is telling Moshe, you can only see the actual actions, but you don't know the 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 face to it. That's one idea. But there's another idea. Face means future. Back means the past. What Moshe was asking, he was asking the Almighty, I want to understand the future. There are things that happen in this world that make no sense to me. How is this going to fit in? God says, no, no, no. You'll never be able to understand the future. But you could see the back, meaning you could see the history. Look back at your life and tell me when I dropped the ball. God says to Moshe, look at my back, meaning my history. You've lived a 100 years, 120 years, Moshe. How many times did I let you down? And each one of us, each and every one of us, think to yourselves. We're worried about the future, but look at the past for a second. You've been living, living, living 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, 60 years, however many years. How many times did God drop the ball? I ask this all the time to people, and people say, you know what? Coming to think of it, not once. Not once. Every time I was worried, how is it going to work out? It always worked out. Not always the way I thought it would. Usually better. I was worried I was going to lose that job. And it turns out I got a much better job that paid me much more, that gave me better, better conditions, a better work environment. I spent more time with my family. Oh, what was I so worried about? When we feel like we're in control, we're out of control. When we recognize that Hashem is in control, we have nothing to worry about. We have absolutely nothing to fear. That's what the purpose of life is, is to just let go. You know what? I'm in the hands of Hashem. Hashem, you've got me. I rely on you. I depend on you. And now I can just Connect as much as possible with the Almighty. All the mitzvahs, you know why they were given to us? All of the Torah, you know why it was given to us? For one purpose, that through the observance of them, our understanding of God will get deepened. Our closeness, our, 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 uh, hargasha is our, our feeling of Hashem's connection with us becomes clearer and clearer. By God's existence, by the knowledge of God, and that Hashem is one. All of God's mitzvahs have one purpose, to bring us emunah. And that's why if you look in the prayer book, before any mitzvah that we, oh, we recite the Omer. We count the Omer. It's a, Seems like a, an innocuous mitzvah. Just count the days between Pesach to Shavuot. That's it. Not a big deal. Guess what? Such a mitzvah has the ability to bring the most incredible clarity to one's life. All it is reciting a blessing and counting the days. What's so complicated? It's not such a complicated mitzvah. But you know what we say before we recite that blessing like we do for any other mitzvah? L'shem Yichud Kutcha Bricho, for the name of the one and only Hashem. And we go on to describe how we want to connect with God and God's oneness through the observance of this mitzvah. Hashem, bring about so that when we count and we do this simple mitzvah of counting the Yomer, 
It should bring us closer to you. We may not understand all of the deep Kabbalistic meanings behind it. We may not understand all of the levels of the pardes, the, 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 just the basic understanding, the remes, all of the hints and what it hints to, the druish, all of the deeper meanings behind it, and then the hidden Kabbalistic reasons. We may not understand it. Hashem, I'm doing this because I, I love you and I want to connect. I have no idea why. It's like your child. You know, if you have some type of, uh, you know, you, you need your child to bring you a tissue. Right? You say, you ask your child to bring you a tissue. Can you bring, pass me a tissue? Your child brings you a tissue. Do they understand why you need a tissue? No. But they know that you're, you're, you're the father, you're the mother, and I want to do something for you because I love you, because you asked me. But hopefully that action makes us closer. And it does. It does make us closer. In our entire lives, it doesn't, we can't, we, this is not a, just a quick fix. Oh, I'm going to do this. I'm going to have my clarity of it my emunah and I'm good to go. Our entire life, we get a higher and higher and higher level, slowly connecting on a higher level. To get deeper and deeper and deeper, one level after another in our relationship with Hashem, bikinyan amiti ad omek hanefesh, with a true possession of this knowledge, till it gets to the depths of our soul. So it's not just, oh, I'm going to go to the park, I'm going to sit on the bench, I'm going to recognize that I'm surrounded by the trees, and I'm surrounded by God's creation, and now I feel like, ah, I'm in God's world, I feel so connected. And now let me go home and eat my food. And now let me go home and just continue watching my television show. And now let me just go do my things, which are distracting me and pulling me away from my connection from God. So it's a life mission to get us to the top level of our connection with God. And a person who gets to the truth, to the real depth of that emunah, of that knowledge of Hashem, he has a, a, an acknowledgement. He has the feeling, a clear clarity of the existence of God and that he and, and God's oneness. He gets the ultimate level of closeness with God. That means it takes a lot of work on our side, pushing away a lot of barriers, a lot of distractions. And the more we do that, and the more we solidify our knowledge of Hashem, that closeness, that relationship, that reliance, that comfort continues to grow and grow and grow. Ki kol Yehudi, because every single Jew, kefi kinyano v'hakara b'yichud Hashem, as much as he's able to, uh, to absorb and connect with the oneness of Hashem, the more you invest, the more you get. The more you invest in that relationship with Hashem, the more you will benefit from that relationship from Hashem. Till it gets to the depths of one's soul. There's no question anymore. He's able to become a chariot for the Shekhinah, where he becomes a billboard for God, so to speak. Where people look at this person and they say, ah, this is a godly man. I'll tell you about such a person in one moment. Because this is the purpose of everything. That God should have a residence in this world. You know how? Through us. We become a vessel through which God says, I want to have my presence on this person. That when people look at this person, they say, oh, this is a godly human being. There was a man, I meant talked about him in the past, in my classes. He just passed away less than a month ago. His name is Rabbi Uri Zohar. Rabbi Uri Zohar, many of you may not have heard this name before. But Rabbi Uri Zohar was Israel's number one television personality. I'm talking the top of the top of the top. You think of the funniest guy in America, the guy who everybody would turn on. We have to see his newest show. We have to see his newest movie. We have to see his newest act. This was the guy. And when he was 40 years old, he met with a rabbi who he always was cynical about rabbis. He was cynical about Judaism. He was completely 
removed from a spiritual life. He lived a very base life. And the rabbi had a very lovely conversation with him. And he was completely blown away. And he started scheduling meetings with this rabbi, talking more and more about God and God's creation and proofs of God, et cetera, et cetera, until he got to a point where he's like, this is, this is really true. And if this is true, guess what? You know what comes along with God? His Torah. And I have to start observing his Torah. So he comes to the set in the studio wearing tzitzit. And everyone starts laughing. They're like, this guy's brilliant. His new act is he's going to start copying religious people. And he says, no, 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 no. No, no, no. This is, this is real. This is for real. I'm wearing my tzitzit. And they started laughing even more. They're like, you see how real this is? See how funny? Like he's making believe. He's even trying to trick us. And slowly but surely they realized that it was real. And he passed away at the age of 83. And he said, I lived two, at two fortieth birthdays when he turned 80. He has said at two fortieth birthdays, one as a non-observant, distanced from God, 40 year old. And then a 40 year old who at the time was 80, who has invested in learning. And he felt that he had to do a rectification for those 40 years. I've heard him say that. And he said that I needed to fix those 40s. He wasn't, he wasn't, he didn't feel like the first 40 years were, I mean, he was many, he was embarrassed by it and he felt that he had, you know, neglected his responsibilities, but he felt that he needs to use it as a tool to inspire and to elevate himself even more. So he actually would go to the, uh, to the uh, arts and to the cinema and to the, uh, you know, the schools that would teach for acting. And he would talk to them as a, now a rabbi and a rab, uh, someone who was very, very knowledgeable in Torah. But here's a guy who transformed his life. I, he lived in my neighborhood where I, where I lived in, in Jerusalem. And I would go pray in the same synagogue that he prayed in on Friday night. And we would walk back home. I would walk back home next to him. And I felt like I was walking next to an angel. He had the fear of God on him. He had the knowledge that he's walking in front of the Almighty. That doesn't mean that he didn't laugh. That didn't mean that he didn't wasn't nice to people. Oh, I'm so holy. I can't even look at people. I can't even talk to people. I'm so holy. No, no, no. That's not what it means. It means that he had a recognition, a seriousness. I'm on a mission. God put me here to accomplish something. He would see people, his face would light up and he would shake their hands. Good Shabbos. How are you? And how's your wife? And how are your kids? And have genuine care and love and concern for every human being. But to me, he was a great example of a modern day vessel of the Almighty on this earth. I took students when we were in Israel. I took students to go get a blessing from him. And we saw him pray the Mincha service, the Mincha prayer. And you see him, he looks like an angel talking to the Almighty. He's like having a, a face-to-face conversation with God. It wasn't just like, oh, I'm mumbling a few words and, and I'm turning the pages and I'm, I'm doing the act. No, 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 no. He was like, I'm talking to the Almighty. And you could see it on him. And he comes outside after he was done the prayer. And we're all standing around. We said, Rabbi, would you mind? We take some pictures. He says, I'm a cinema guy. I love cameras. And he took pictures with everyone, but he talked to everyone and, and, and listened to everyone's story. And we were infused with holiness. When we walked away, we just felt like we were just on a whole new level. Like we spoke to someone who's connected on a higher level, someone who was able to elevate us. That's what we all need to be. We all need to become someone who's a representative of the Almighty. He was videoed not long ago, before he passed, right before he passed away. He was videoed. Someone said to him, look at you. You had a penthouse on the Mediterranean Sea in Tel Aviv. Like you had the dream home and you had everything. And look at you now. You're sitting here in an apartment that's, you know, 12 feet by 18 feet. You know, it's like you have a kitchen, a little kitchen, a little table here. Uh, He had a bed that that was held up by a telephone book. You know, one of the legs was held up by, you know, it's like he says, I'm the wealthiest man on earth. There's nothing that I don't have that I want. I have everything. 
I'm the most amazing wife. I have, my, I have everything I need. I have all my, all my books that I need to learn. I have my study partner sitting right here. What else do I need? There's nothing that exists in the world that I want that I don't have. I thought it was a great definition. But here's someone who wants to create an example of what it means to create a place for God in this world where God can reside within each and every one of us. Ze ikarachim, this is the purpose of life. Vitachlit kol avoda, and the purpose of all of our work that we do in this world. Laakir bamitat v'yichud Hashem. To recognize and to live with that knowledge of Hashem and His oneness. Umitoch ze, and through this, litchaberimo, to connect with God. Vilidabek bo betanug, and to be cleaving to Hashem with pleasure. Because I have nothing to fear. The happiest place for that little baby is in the mother's arms. The happiest place for us, God's baby, is in God's arms. And when we're able to put ourselves, you know what? It's not about me. Not about my career. It's not about my bank account. It's not about my gadgets. And it's not about my toys. And not about my cars. And not about my my, my boats and all of my things. Me, 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 me. I'm in the hands of Hashem. And you know what? Enjoy those things. God gave you those things to enjoy. But recognize that it's a gift from Hashem. So now you go on that speedboat and you go on that the jet ski and you're enjoying, ah, oh, this is amazing. Hashem, I love you. Thank you. It's a very different way to go jet skiing. And you're just like, it's my boat. You like my boat? It's a very different experience. This is my pickup truck. No, it's a gift from Hashem. And I explained yesterday in the class, you know how to make your car spiritual? Your car, your car. People use their car as a statement. Look at me, look at me, look at my fancy car. Use it for a mitzvah. Go volunteer. Use that car to carry things to the sick people in the hospital. Let someone needs a car, let them borrow it. My Tesla, are you kidding? No one, no one drives my car. Yeah, you know what? Why did God give it to me? To serve him. This is the way I can serve him. Let someone who's in need. They need someone needs a ride from the airport. Let's go. I'll take you. Utilize the gift that God has given you for good. Not just for me. Use it to serve Hashem by helping others, by recognizing that everything is a gift from Hashem. Now everything has purpose. Ad shalo yelo ba'olamo elo at Hashem Yisbarach. Until a person gets to a point where the only thing that exists in his world is Hashem. Ki hu hakol. Because indeed, everything that exists in this world is Hashem. Like this pen. This pen is the will of Hashem. And when we recognize that everything, even this piece of paper right here, is the will of Hashem, then our life is a very different life. Now I can connect where I know, I recognize that I'm living in a world of godliness. Everything is God. Everything that exists. The food that I eat is godliness. I was, when I was learning this the first time, it was Monday night, it was late in the evening, I sit with my study partner. It was after my Musser master class that we have on Monday nights. I came home, I'm relaxing now, drinking a glass of wine, and we're learning. And we're learning further down, he talks about eating. And here I made even a blessing on my wine. But let me tell you how it t- transformed my experience of drinking this glass of wine. He says, do you realize that everything that we eat, everything that we have is from Hashem? So I started realizing, here I'm holding this glass of wine, and I never even thought about that. I said thank you to Hashem. I made the blessing. I said the blessing, okay? But think of this. Where does this wine come from? This wine came from a barrel that came from the product of grapes. The grapes came from the vine. The vine comes from the ground, which was planted by one seed that was watered by the rain that Hashem dropped on that seed. Suddenly I realized, one second, Hashem provided for that seed to grow to become a vine, And then Hashem provided from that vine grapes, 
which were picked and later smashed and made into this, put into this barrel so that they can be there for as long as they are there. And then it's put into a bottle and then delivered to my house, not delivered, but to the store, but then, right? All of these steps that need to happen so that I can sit here on a Monday night learning with my study partner and drink a glass of wine. You know what's in that wine? Godliness. You're drinking something that God created just for you. And there I was a minute ago drinking that wine and enjoying just the flavor of the wine and tasting those grapes. And it's, it, wow, it's delicious. So now it became a godly experience. God himself made this wine for me to enjoy. It was a transformative experience where it wasn't just, oh, wine, wine is good. Thank you, Hashem. And now let me drink my wine and I'm good to go. It's to make it that I re- recognize that everything of food, imagine you take a sandwich and you realize the steps that went into that bread and that pastrami being there. And you can throw in the pickle and the mustard and the ketchup or whatever else you add in there. Do you know how many people needed to help get that onto your plate? From the farmers to the people who, who, right, who slaughtered the animal, all right, and the people who cleaned it and the people who washed it and the people who packaged it. You're talking about probably 200 people that worked to get you that food on your plate. There's a lot of love there. A lot of hard work. For who? For you. For you to enjoy. It's living a whole different life. Living a life of appreciation, of gratitude, of thankfulness. But number one, recognizing that it's all from Hashem. That everything we have is from Hashem. Because the moment we get to that clarity, on the highest level, we have something which is called dvekut. Dvekut means like, Devek means glue. Glue. Dvekut means like to cleave to Hashem. Where I'm one with Hashem. Where when we have a challenge, we don't think to ourselves, well, should I do this? Should I do that? Tot Hashem, Hashem, what should I do? Guide me. And He will always guide you. Hashem will always guide you. We have to talk to Him. So, let's close this out. Every single person, every single Jew wants to get to this point of dvekut, of this closeness with Hashem. The question is that I'm sure right after we open up for questions, everyone's going to say, okay, Rabbi, you're talking about these lofty levels. Okay, but how do I get there? All right. How do I get to that point where I am at that ultimate clarity and ultimate knowledge of Hashem and where I have that cleaving to Hashem, that oneness and that closeness to Hashem. For sure, that every person has felt at once in their life, the pleasure of serving God. And the internal connection with Hashem. There are some of us who can are able to be on that level of connection only seldomly. There are those who are able to feel it on a regular basis. And their only request, What do we want? Us, me, simple person. What do we want? I want to connect with the Almighty, and to live that emunah, live that knowledge of Hashem. What do we want? All we want is to to have pleasure. What type of pleasure? Pleasure of that connection where we're feeling connected, where we're one with Hashem, where we have no barriers. That's why, by the way, we mentioned this last week. Why are there mitzvahs that are prohibitions. Don't do. Don't do this. Because just like, you know, a, li- a light bulb comes with mitzvahs that are performative mitzvahs, right? Turn it in. Be careful when you turn in the light bulb into the, into the socket, okay? But there's also prohibition. 
Make sure your hands aren't wet and you don't touch the outlet. Why? Because then you're not going to be able to enjoy this light bulb ever again. You'll be electrocuted. Right? Why are you telling me what not to do? I'll do whatever I want to do. Fine. We have to understand that in order to maximize this world that we're living in, there has to be the qualifications of how to maximize the experience. There are things that we need to do and things that we need not to do. And those ingredients need to be put in properly so that we don't blow it and that we're able to maximize that pleasure. So we shouldn't be looking at the Torah saying, oh, I can't believe it's so restrictive. Why does God want me not to do this? Why does he want me not to do that? Well, if you're looking at the grand scheme of things, at the big picture of pleasure, these are all the ingredients, what you need to do and not to do, are exactly prescribed so that we maximize pleasure in this world. Yeah, you're telling me not to eat that food? You're telling me not to eat pork? <laughs> Everyone says it's the greatest food in the world. Guess what? Hashem is telling us that if you want to connect on the highest level of pleasure, some things you're going to have to stay away from. And there's some things you're going to have to connect yourself to. Like the Shabbos. Shabbos is a day that maximizes that connection with Hashem. And it removes all the barriers. Think of it. What does someone want when they go on vacation? Nothing. I just want to do nothing. Hashem says here, I'm giving you a vacation every week. Do nothing. You prepare all Thursday, Friday. You prepare till sunset. Boom. Now we do nothing. Everything is ready. The food is all prepared. The food is all cooked. The table is all set. Everything now just enjoy. I don't want you doing anything productive or creative. Just enjoy. So, ech zokim zokim belimud vehatfilah. Okay, how do we get that we to be at a point where we have at every moment that connection with God, every moment, every moment, a connection with God? How do we merit that we learn and we pray? How do we get to a point? How do we merit that our prayer and our learning will also be a pleasure and a point of connection? It'll be living in our connection with Hashem. And someone who is able to already feel that connection with God, and then the, the, those who are able to connect will also feel there are some times that they're not able to feel that connection so well. And sometimes they feel like they're distant from that light from that connection. And it's very difficult for them to feel that oneness. What do, what do we do in those times when we feel empty and disconnected? How can we connect with the Almighty with pleasure at every time, at every moment, at every place, and every condition? We all know that we have physical needs. We have materialistic needs. And the desires, the physical desires and the physical pleasures sometimes overcome the spiritual desires and the spiritual pleasures. And many people who are on that track to get to that holiness and spirituality feel like sometimes they get stopped. Sometimes they hit a barrier. They hit a, they hit a partition that doesn't let them go and, and elevate themselves more. And sometimes because of the physical things that we need. You know what? We only eat. Sometimes we can get carried away by that eating. Right? We all need to sleep, but sometimes we can get carried away by that sleeping. And it means we need to sleep. It's a necessary evil. Food is a necessary evil. It's We need food because otherwise we're done. Right? But how do I enjoy that food properly without getting carry, carried away by it? They're obligated. We need to have. They're mandatory things that we need to have in this world. Like eating and sleeping. 
But how do we not get carried away? Bishar Putu Yetzer and all the other temptations of the Yetzahara, of the evil inclination. And they all ask, what do we do? What do we do? How do we get ourselves holy? How do we make ourselves holy? And this book, that God willing, we're going to continue to study together. We'll find the time. Discusses exactly how to make ourselves holy in all of these situations. He says, hopefully with Hashem's mercy, we'll be able to succeed at Hashar Lederach Lezakot Lechiot Chaye Emet Betanu Gamet. How to live a true life. Hopefully we'll be able to learn from this book how to live a true life with true pleasure. Lezakot Lehakir B'Yuchad Hashem. And hopefully we'll merit to have the clarity of the oneness of Hashem. V'Lechiot Et Mitziyuto. And to live with that reality that Hashem is there with us. And to feel God's closeness and to connect with Him in every situation, at every moment of life. And to, and to be able to overcome all of the distractions and all of the manipulations of our evil desires, of our evil inclination. Because our soul is thirsty for one thing. One thing. And that's the connection with Hashem. The only thing that our soul wants is to know and have clarity of Hashem. That's it. That's what your soul wants. And the only desire of the soul is to be connected and become one with the Almighty. It's an amazing, amazing journey. And if an amazing comparison to this is a relationship of a husband and wife. The relationship of a husband and wife is compared to our connection with God. What is the ultimate connection of a husband and wife to become one with one another not only physically but to be in sync with each other to understand each other's challenges each other's strengths each other's weaknesses each other's wants each other's needs to be completely in sync do you know what it takes to be completely in sync as a couple to getting rid of yourself when we get rid of our own me 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 And we start thinking about we, we, we. It changes our entire relationship. I tell young guys who are dating, I say, stop thinking about yourself. We're engrossed with ourselves. We're thinking about, I know what I want to drink. Do you know what she wants to drink? Mm, No. How should I know? Well, find out. What's her favorite drink? I have a friend of mine. He told me that when he'd come back from a date, his mother would ask him, what color are the girl's eyes? He's like, I I don't know. (laughs) How am I supposed to know what color her eyes were? He said, you don't know? How can you not know that? You just spent a few hours meeting this young lady, having coffee together, talking, laughing, schmoozing, whatever it is. Don't forget that in a Torah observant lifestyle, the, the dating life is very, very different. It's a completely different experience than what the world is familiar with. It's not non-physical, 100% non-physical. There's no touching, not even shaking hands. And it's just having a quality relationship, getting to know each other. Do you have this, share the same values? Do you share the same philosophy? Do you share the same morals, the same ethics? Do you have the same vision for life? Do you share, you know, hopes and dreams? Is this someone that you can work together with in building a life together. Once you start mixing in the emotional parts, the physical parts, it's very difficult to connect the mind to know what's what's right and what's wrong. You spend time together, you don't know what color her eyes are. Pay attention! That's the number one problem is that guys don't know how to pay attention. And today it's even worse with our cell phones. We have distractions on top of distractions. That's what marriage is. Marriage is a tool to help us 
connect with Hashem. Because we also have to let go of our own personal selfishness if we want to connect with God. We can carry our own bags. It's going to be heavy. And give it to the Almighty. He says, no problem. I got you covered. We have our own worries. We have our own fears. When the relationship with Hashem is not perfect where it should be. Kizekol Hadam, this is man. You want to know what man is? Man is a challenge. We're here in this world not to coast, not to just be on autopilot. That's not the purpose of life. We all have challenges. And if we unmute the microphones and we say, okay, what's your challenge? What's your challenge? Everybody's got a challenge. That means we're living. We're all living in a world that has challenges. There's one way to get out of it 100% of the time. That's our connection with Hashem. Hashem li lo ira. If we know that Hashem is with me and we feel that connection with Hashem, lo ira, I have nothing to worry about. No anxiety, no fears, no worries, no stress, nothing. Hashem clears it all. Because we know we have 100% reliance on Hashem. He's got us covered. And you know the proof of it? Look back at the past. Look at your, your past few years and tell me, is there one time that God let you go and you said, no, I'm gonna, just going to drop you. I don't care about you. Never. Never. Every time it worked out better than you imagined. Hashem should continue to bless us. To have that clarity, to have that connection, to be able to know and feel that oneness of Hashem and to elevate ourselves one rung after another rung after another rung to have the perfection of what this world is about, an ultimate connection, a life of ultimate pleasure and oneness with Hashem. Amen. All right, any questions, my dear friends? Excellent question. So we have to understand that Judaism is the only religion that has a plan not only for the Jews. Where the Torah says that all a non-Jew needs to do is observe these seven Noahide laws. Right. That's it. And there are many Jews who wish they had only seven laws. Right? <laughs> they wish, they wish, what are you, 613, really? Couldn't we just narrow it down to seven? Right? So there are seven basic principles. And we have to understand that the, the job of a quarterback is different than the job of the linebacker that's different than the job of the defensive line. <laughs> Everyone has a different job. And the job of the Jewish people is different than the job of the nations of the world. And by the way, anybody who wants to join the Jewish people, it's not the easiest process, but there's a process to joining. Because yeah. it's just like I was just talking to somebody who was telling me about someone who had converted and someone didn't accept the conversion. Whatever, it was a whole thing. I, I don't know. I don't get into conversions, me personally. I just like – I teach Torah. Anybody who wants to learn about Torah, about Judaism, I'm, I'm going to talk. And, and I don't care if someone is Jewish or isn't Jewish. I, that's not my business. Okay. I'm business of teaching Torah. So let me tell you. So this guy tells me, so someone once came to a program and he said, oh, I'm, I, I'm a convert of such and such person. And it was, I don't remember what the issue was, but I needed to find out, um, from the rabbi who converted him. I called the rabbi and I said to the rabbi, you know, I met such and such individual. He says, yes, yes, I know him. I said, did you indeed convert him? He says, yes, I converted him. I said, great. I just want to, have clarity, you know, was there ever a point where he observed the mitzvot as supposed to? And he's like, oh, no, he never did that. I said, did you ever know if he actually believed in God? No, I never. He says he was such a nice guy. How can I say no to him? So I said, you know, it's like saying to someone, you know, you're such a nice guy. Let me just give you a license to fly a plane. It's like, you're such a nice guy. Can't say no. Right. What do you mean? Right. Hi, the guy's... There has to be certain qualifications that get you into that cockpit and allow you to fly a plane, right? We all understand that. Sure. But it doesn't mean that every person has to be a pilot. It doesn't mean that every person has to be the quarterback. It doesn't mean that every person has to be the general manager. Everyone has their own job. Everyone has their own responsibility. And okay. we don't we don't believe in Judaism that only if you observe the Torah, 613 commandments, and are Jewish, that you have a place in the world to come and you have a place in heaven. We don't believe that. Every person, every creation of God has their own perfection that gets them into the world to come and has their place in heaven. Okay. And you, So it's not only 
for Jews. Oh, if you're Jewish, this applies to you. Everybody else go suffer uh, your own way. No. These are the seven fundamental principles. And right. a person has to dig into it to understand how this perfects me, how this brings me to that oneness of Hashem. Now, obviously, the more commandments that one observes, the, the right. deeper that relationship is going to grow. But it's, we're not an exclusive religion where, you right. know, in Islam, if you don't, if you don't believe in Islam, right. you're called an infidel and you're, you're warranting right. death. Right. And they, and they exactly. kill you. And the same is with Christianity. There are Christian, millions yeah. and millions of Jews who died at the stake in the central square, in Rome and everywhere else, because they weren't willing to accept the beliefs of Christianity. In Judaism, do you ever see a single Jew kill a non-Jew? Right? There's there's no such thing in history. You know what? The non-Jews can live their life perfectly well, and, and the Jews will never harm them. With that, my dear friends, it's a special privilege and an honor to spend my Sunday morning with all y'all. So thank you so much. If you have any questions, you're welcome to email me, awolbe at torchweb.org, awolbe at torchweb.org. Have a magnificent week, everyone. You've been listening to the Jewish Inspiration Podcast, a Torch production. Become a supporter at torchweb.org because your assistance enables more Torah learning around the globe. To find more lessons offered by Torch, please visit torchpodcast.com.